Beloved people of God, grace and peace to you from Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, Pastor Brian Zond and his spouse Perry love to travel to Portugal. On one visit to Lisbon, the capital, as they strolled through the heart of the city, he noticed a statue of a military hero astride a horse, reins in one hand and sword in the other. It dawned on Zahn that he had seen a similar statue in every national capital he had ever visited, from Lisbon to London, from Rome to Paris, from St. Petersburg to Washington, D.C. As he said to Perry, there's always some dude on a horse. Now, after mentioning this observation in a sermon, people began sending him pictures of these horse-riding dudes from other capitals around the world. Now, in Washington, D.C., the dude with a tricorn hat uh, who's on a horse is George Washington. Pastor Zond acknowledges that it makes a difference if the dude is your dude. Most Americans, he explains, upon beholding this marble dude, will feel the kind of patriotic stirring in their bosom that the citizens of other lands feel for their equestrian statuary, unquote. These statues celebrate military might and imperial conquest. Now, in biblical times, horses were almost always war horses. A conquering ruler would ride into a city on a war horse. Now, according to Zahn, in the spring of 30 CE, the common area, Pontius, common era, Pontius Pilate rode into Jerusalem from the west on a horse at the head of a military cohort of cavalry. It was important for the Roman governor to be in Jerusalem during the Passover to maintain order. That same week, Jesus rode into Jerusalem not on a war horse, but on a donkey. He was accompanied by his disciples and a crowd of Passover pilgrims from Galilee. They believed that Jesus was the long-expected Messiah who would overthrow Rome and bring in the kingdom of God. Now, in one sense, as Zond observes, Jesus' triumphal entry was a ridiculous sight. He says Jesus rides a donkey so small that his feet drag on the ground. Jesus' triumphal entry was the anti-military parade. It was a mockery of Rome's intimidating show of military power. Imagine a mock military parade where peace protesters are riding tricycles instead of tanks. And you get the idea, unquote. Now make no mistake, Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. His triumphal entry into Jerusalem was street theater at its finest. The contrast between the two parades could not have been more striking. The one featured a dude on a war horse, the other featured a dude on a donkey. The dude on the war horse led a cohort of well-armed soldiers the dude on the donkey was accompanied by a motley crew of followers armed with palm branches. Pontius Pilate and his military cohort projected the power of the Roman Empire. Jesus and his followers projected an alternative empire of peace, what we call the kingdom of God. The Roman parade was all about wielding power by lording it over and dominating others. Jesus was all about exercising authority by serving God and others. Roman power was maintained in part by a willingness to execute enemies. Jesus and his followers derived their power by embracing the cross and forgiving enemies. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem dramatized the nonviolent way of life that he lived among us and sought to teach his followers. He embodied a new way of being human in the world. Now, nonviolent does not mean it was a passive way of life. In Jesus' view, trying to fight the Roman Empire with violence would have been an exercise in futility. He viewed nonviolence as a way of resisting a way of life based on domination and violent coercion. He advocated a very different way of exercising power and authority than was common in his time. In Mark 10, 42 through 45, Jesus instructed his disciples, 
You know that among the Gentiles, that is the non-Jews, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Followers of Jesus resist, therefore, by refusing to take up a coercive, violent way of life. Now, in our country, the most well-known follower of Jesus' nonviolent way of life has been Martin Luther King, Jr. And his six principles of nonviolence are anything but passive. Number one, nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. It is active, nonviolent resistance to evil. Number two, nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. The end result of nonviolence is redemption and reconciliation. Number three, nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, not people. Nonviolence recognizes that evildoers are also victims. Number four, nonviolence holds that suffering can educate and transform. Nonviolence willingly accepts the consequences of its acts. Number five, Nonviolence chooses love instead of hate. Nonviolence resists violence to the spirit as well as the body. Nonviolent love is active, not passive. Nonviolent love does not sink to the level of the hater. Love restores community and resists injustice. Nonviolence recognizes the fact that all life is interrelated. And then finally, number six. Nonviolence believes that the universe is on the side of justice. And so the nonviolent resistor has deep faith that justice will eventually win. Now, the situation in Ukraine has put to the test the principles of nonviolent resistance. The people of Ukraine have been admired around the world for their violent resistance to the invasion of the Russians. If there ever was a ruthless dude on a war horse, it is Vladimir Putin although he is a cowardly one. We are not going to see him anywhere near the front lines. The people of Ukraine are fighting to defend their homeland. Nonviolent resistance would seem to be futile and powerless in the face of the ruthless exercise of destructive power. Nonviolent resistance seems too idealistic to many. Followers of Jesus, we are certainly not in a position to throw stones at the brave efforts of the Ukrainians to defend their homeland. But fighting violence with violence will at best always be a provisional response. As Jesus instructed his disciples in Matthew 26, 52, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword or as the more familiar saying goes, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Unless human beings learn how to live nonviolently, we will continue to destroy each other. Ultimately, nonviolence is not an ideal, it is common sense. Insanity is to keep repeating the same failed destructive strategies. In the conclusion of a December 16th, 2021 article in Sojourners, Adam Russell Taylor writes, quote, policymakers have at their disposal a broad array of nonviolent tools that have been developed and implemented by governments, regional and international organizations, churches, and civil society. They must simply choose to use them, unquote. The challenge is for us to learn to use them before we have destroyed each other and our earth home. Now, Jesus' ride into Jerusalem on a donkey dramatized God's intention to establish a kingdom of peace. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. The biblical vision of peace is not simply the absence of violent conflict, although that is certainly an important aspect of the vision. Shalom is about well-being in mind, body, and spirit, well-being in our relationships, well-being in our neighborhoods and communities, well-being among nations, well-being in our watersheds and ecosystems. 
as Jesus neared near Jerusalem, he looked out over the city from the Mount of Olives and wept over it. If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace. Jesus must have sensed that the, cries, crowds, the crowd's cries of Hosanna would soon turn to crucify him. How fickle we human beings can be. In Luke's account of the crucifixion of Jesus, Jesus persisted in being nonviolent to the end, even praying from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. As Pastor Zahn concludes, so much depends on which parade we decide to march in. The parade that celebrates empire and militarism and trusts in war to shape the world, or the parade that celebrates the Prince of Peace and trusts in God to heal the world. One parade is led by some dude on a horse or a tank, and those who follow are armed with swords or combat rifles. The other parade is led by a king on a donkey, and those who follow are armed with nothing more deadly than palm branches." Unquote. Now, trusting in God to heal does not mean we are to be passive. On Ash Wednesday, we included Rabbi Jack Reamer's poem, We Cannot Pray to You. The first stanza was, We cannot pray to you, O God, to banish war, for you have filled the world with paths to peace, if only we would take them. Followers of Jesus know that Jesus is our dude on a donkey, and they take God's paths to peace. In Jesus' name, 